begin by reading the passage that I've been referring to throughout the service, Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. I think we have uh, certainly have read this on, on at least on one occasion or another and uh, have wondered about it. Um, I, think, um, I think it's actually quite plain, and I think it certainly means what it says, but we do need to put it in its, um, in its context and understand. Uh, this really won't make any sense unless we understand that the people who uh, suffered these things actually deserve this and much worse as we did outside of Jesus. Okay, so let's, um, let's take a look at this. Chapter 13 of Luke, verses 1 through 9, beginning in verse 1. Now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. Well, may the Lord bless uh, his word to our understanding this morning. And uh, again, you know, yes, our Lord Jesus Christ actually said these words. He spoke the truth, and the truth needs to be spoken if people are going to be saved. Now, remember last week Jesus told us, told his disciples that he came to cast fire upon the earth, not the fire of his judgment. It wasn't time yet for judgment, but the fire of his Holy Spirit to strengthen his disciples so that they might tell everyone they saw about the good news uh, of Jesus and what he has done to save sinners. Now, Jesus did say the result would be that many would come and begin to follow him by his grace. But as they did, he also pointed out that it would bring division, and that division would go as deep, even, uh, even as deep as their families. Uh, believers and unbelievers, we're told in Scripture, are as different as they can possibly be as different as day and night, uh, heat and cold, light and darkness, right? They are moral opposites to one another. Now, Jesus was telling them this because um, as they received Jesus and they began to love in the way that he loves, it was going to cause hatred on the other end. Remember what Jesus said on another occasion, don't be surprised if the world hates you. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, if you become like me, Jesus is saying, then they're going to hate you in the same way. Now, the hatred needs to be just one-sided. You know, we're not supposed to hate the world. They may hate us. We need to love them and seek to bring them uh, to Jesus. Now, Jesus went on to warn the Jews that, that were also listening who hadn't yet believed in him that they needed to make sure that they were on the right side of that divide when that divide took place. Jesus pointed out to them that just as they could tell what the weather was going to be like by looking at the sky or noticing where the wind was blowing from, so they could know that He was the Messiah by all the signs that were surrounding Him. They needed to settle their accounts with God by trusting in Him while they still could. The door of His grace was open, but it would eventually close, and then it would be too late. Remember, we saw that last time. There's a time limit. The judge would eventually throw them into prison if they reached basically the, uh, the judgment seat of the judge before they settled along the way. And if the judge threw them into prison, he said they would never come out from there until they had paid the last cent. And they could never pay the debt which they owe. Now, this morning we see, I think, something of their response 
uh, the crowd began to do essentially what most people do today when they are confronted with the gospel. They deflect, try to get the attention off of themselves onto someone else, onto someone they think is worse than they are in order to comfort themselves. I'm not that bad. I mean, look at these, these people. Look what happened to them. But we also need to see here it didn't work. Jesus tells them that they are just as bad as these other people. And if they don't repent, they will also perish. Now, this morning, I want us to look at two things. First of all, that everyone is guilty and deserves God's judgment. Certainly, that was true of us. It's true of all people. Of course, we've been delivered in the Lord Jesus. But secondly, the only thing holding judgment back is God's patience. But that patience, we know, eventually runs out. So first of all, everyone is guilty and deserves God's judgment. We see this in the two examples that are given and in the two statements that Jesus makes in response to them. Now, the first example was brought up by some in the crowd in verse 1. Luke writes this. Now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now, we don't know exactly what it was the crowd was referring to. It could have been something that had happened recently, or it could have been something that happened a while ago. Some commentators believe that this event was really the same event that Gamaliel uh, mentioned when the apostles were on trial. Remember when he said that these, these men rose up, but what they did came to nothing? He said this about a particular man by the name of Judas in Acts 5.37. After this man, after um, Thutis, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. John Gill, the Bible commentary, uh, commentator, tells us that Judas, this particular Judas, not the one that betrayed Jesus, was counseling the Jews, urging the Jews to disobey the Roman government, not pay their taxes to Caesar. And this so enraged Pilate that he sent soldiers to kill Judas and his followers as they were sacrificing at the feast of the Passover in Jerusalem, mixing their blood with the blood of their sacrificial lambs. Now again, they appeared by giving this illustration to be deflecting from themselves, turning Jesus' attention to them because surely they are worse than we are because look what happened to them. But again, notice what Jesus did. He didn't let them off the hook. He replies in verses 2 and 3. Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this faith? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then Jesus went on uh, to illustrate this with one other example that they didn't bring up, but he did. Verse 4. Or do you suppose... That those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem. Now, this event we really know nothing about except what Jesus says about it right here. We do know that Siloam was basically that place that was near Jerusalem, the place where Jesus sent the blind man, remember, to wash after he applied the clay to his eyes because of the pool that was there. Gill suggests that these 18 men might have been there at the pool, uh, performing purification rites when one of these towers fell on them and killed them. Now, the question again is, does the way these died show that these men were worse than the Jews that Jesus was then speaking with? He again answers in verse 5, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, what Jesus is reflecting here is, is what we know to be true. Death is what everyone deserves because everyone has sinned. Paul writes in Romans 3.23, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And 6.23, the wages of sin is death. So unless they repent of their sins, by which Jesus didn't mean just simply turn away from their sins, but repent is basically a shortcut, even as believe is, for the two elements that are involved in conversion. Turn away from your sins and believe or trust in Jesus. And Jesus is telling them, unless they did that, 
they too would perish. Now, Jesus is not saying here that everyone is equally guilty. Remember what we saw in in Luke chapter 12, just in the last chapter, that there are some who are going to be punished more than others. Remember what he said, that those who knew, those servants who knew more of God's will but did not do it, the Jews, okay, would be punished more than those who did not know his will but still did deeds worthy of a flogging, which would be the Gentiles. You know, there are differing degrees of punishment. He's not talking about that, but what he is saying is this, that they are all bad enough to be executed at any time by the righteous and holy God. Okay? If you don't think that's what Jesus is saying, reflect upon his words again. Are, were these men worse culprits? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. You'll perish in the same way that These men did. Paul tells us in Romans 3, verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. Now, you know, sometimes we might have a hard time kind of coming to grips with this because as we look at people around us, sometimes they don't look like they're so bad, right? Maybe these Galileans didn't look so bad. Maybe these men uh, that the tower fell on who were washing in the pool of Siloam didn't look necessarily that bad, but they really are. Everyone really is. Not only do we come into the world already guilty of cosmic treason, the sin of Adam in disobeying God, but we have committed acts like this over and over again. Now, Jonathan Edwards, I think you know that I appreciate his his thinking. He's not always the easiest to understand, but he is very insightful. has an interesting illustration uh, to point out to those who think they are relatively good Or really, when he wrote this, he was thinking more about Christians who look at unbelievers and think that they are relatively good, that they do more good than bad. Uh, In this particular quote, it comes from the the work of um, Edwards called Original Sin, where he was arguing against a, a particular theologian who was saying that people really aren't that bad. You know, original sin isn't really that bad. Well, he points out, that they're, they're not good. They really are that bad. And here's the illustration that he gives. Um, this is a little bit of a lengthy quote. I'll try to make it um, uh, understandable. Okay, so in that context, are unbelievers not that bad? Are they innocent? Are they good? He says here, Therefore, how absurd must it be for Christians to object against the depravity of man's nature, that they're as bad as, they, as, they, as the Bible says they are, to object against that a greater number of innocent and kind actions than of crimes, and to talk of a prevailing innocence, good nature, industry, and cheerfulness of the greater part of mankind. Infinitely more absurd than it would be to insist, now here are his illustrations, that the domestic of a prince, his servant, was not a bad servant, Because though sometimes he condemned and affronted his master to a great degree, yet he did not spit in his master's face so often as he performed acts of service. Okay, So he didn't spit in his face as much as he he did good things for him. And then he goes on to say this, more absurd than it would be to affirm that his spouse, okay, the same master's, in this case his spouse, that his spouse was a good wife to him, Because although she committed adultery, and that with slaves and scoundrels sometimes, yet she did not do this so often as she did the duties of a wife. These notions would be absurd, because the crimes are too heinous to be atoned for by many honest actions of the servant or spouse of the prince, there being a vast disproportion between the merit of the one and the ill desert of the other but infinitely less than that between the demerit of our offenses against God and the value of our acts of obedience. So what he's saying is, let's say we we do good things a, a lot of times, and we do more good things than bad things. He says, first of all, do you realize, he didn't actually say it here, but he he does say it elsewhere, that those good things they do really aren't good because they don't have the right motive. But do you realize that these supposed good things they do are nothing in comparison with spitting in his face and committing acts of adultery against the infinitely worthy God? These acts that really aren't good 
can't outweigh the absolute evil of the sin that they are committing. It does not tip the scales in the other direction. Simply to say this, Jesus tells us that everyone deserves to perish because the sins we have committed are far greater than any supposed good that we might ever do. Now, we need to stop and think about this too at this particular juncture. Was, was Jesus trying to terrorize them? Was he trying to be vindictive and harsh? You know, did he say this in an unloving way? Think about when, when God appears in the garden, we often wonder what kind of tone did he use when he called out Adam and Eve? Adam, where are you? You know, was it, or was it Adam? Was it, was it a voice of concern or was it of judgment? Okay. Well, I don't think Jesus was being judgmental here. I don't think he was being harsh. I think he was simply telling them what they needed to hear. And that is the truth. Jesus is our example of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. These people were in real danger, the danger of God's judgment, and they needed to know that they were in danger. Now, let's contrast what Jesus does here with the message we often hear in evangelistic services and coming from the church today, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That sounds a little bit different, doesn't it, from what Jesus is saying here. And the reason why they say that is because it's easier to talk to somebody else about the good things that God has prepared for those who believe than it is to tell them what God's going to do to them if they don't believe. And I think that's one of the reasons is because many Christians don't believe that God is the one who's going to do that anyway. Basically, they're going to walk into hell by themselves and God's going to lament and grieve over the fact that they've entered in there and that he doesn't really have a hand in judging them. There are many believers who believe that actually today. Well, Jesus isn't here trying to win friends and influence people. He's not trying to make them listen by saying something very comforting. Rather, he is telling them the truth, and it's the whole truth, and they need to hear it. As a matter of fact, Jonathan Edwards noted that in his day that telling people about hell was much more effective in getting them to listen than telling them about heaven because people were more concerned about avoiding pain than they were about pleasure that they were going to miss. And when you add to that the fact that unbelievers really have no appreciation for heaven anyway, how can you actually dangle that bait in front of them? They, they have no desire for it if they really understand what heaven is. And that is standing in the presence of God and seeing his beauty and worshiping him. Unbelievers don't want to do that, so that's not going to tempt them to trust in the Lord Jesus. But hell, that might frighten them enough to wake them up to get them to run. Let's, let's not forget what God did in his working in Israel. Who was the one he sent to them first? John the Baptist. And what did John the Baptist preach? Flee from the wrath that is coming. And let's also notice that Jesus didn't come in and then begin just preaching good things. I mean, they're all good things, but he came in preaching the truth. And the truth is, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve to die and perish in hell forever. And that's what would have happened to us, but for God's grace and his mercy and his patience. So secondly, Jesus tells them, the only thing that's holding back the judgment, the tower from falling on you is God's patience. But you need to understand that patience does not last forever. It is going to run out. So we read about this in verses 6 through 9. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. Now, this is really an example of the patience of the Lord, but also the end of that patience. The Lord often, as we know in Scripture, used a fig tree to represent his people, didn't he? And... The reason he used a fig tree is because it, it bears fruit. He could have used, I suppose, other trees, but he chose this particular tree. But the reason he set Israel apart as his own covenant people was that they might bear fruit, okay? The fruit of a godly example. 
the fruit of, of holiness. He wanted them to be a light to the nations so that people might come and learn about the covenant God of Israel. But, but there was a problem with this particular tree. Every time the Lord seemed to come looking for fruit, he didn't find any. I mean, ultimately, that was Israel's undoing. Remember what the author to the Hebrews said about why he put away, set aside the old covenant and brought in the new? The problem wasn't with the covenant. The problem was with the people. And this is what he says. They did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. That's the reason why in the new covenant, he writes the law in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and gives us the desire to do it. Now, in this parable, the man had been coming for three years. Three years is about how long a tree would be given to test it to see whether it was going to be a good tree or a bad tree. And it's also interesting to note, <clears throat> right now, Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem, which means he's about three years into his ministry. This is how long Jesus has been ministering to Israel for three years. Now, this man uh, wanted to cut the tree down. A tree that doesn't produce fruit isn't really a good use of space, so we're going to get rid of this one and we're going to plant another one. It was time to get rid of it. But the vineyard keeper asked the man to be patient for one more year. He's going to apply fertilizer to it and so forth. And, you know, one more year, that's about how much time Jesus had yet perhaps to minister. And he says, if it bears fruit, good, but if not, cut it down. So the man agreed that he would be patient. Now, Jesus here is saying that God would also be patient. And he was patient for more than just one more year, wasn't he? They took his son and they crucified him. And then after he rose and ascended, he sent his Holy Spirit to empower his disciples and they preached to the Jews for another 40 years before the Lord finally cut that tree down by sending his judgment in 70 A.D., but we need to understand, even after he cut that tree down and planted a new tree, well, not really a new tree in a certain sense, but after he broke off the branches and grafted in, you know, he grafted in these other branches, there's still mercy extended to Israel, isn't there? The Lord is still extending his patient hand of mercy to them as well as to all the nations because God is patient. But that patience, again, um, is meant to lead unbelievers to repentance. It's not meant to give them more time necessarily to sin. We need to see the Lord's, um, the reason why he does this. The Lord really takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, right? I know that sounds kind of strange, but it's actually true from a Calvinistic perspective. He says in Ezekiel 18 verse 23, do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? You see, even in a Calvinistic viewpoint, God still doesn't delight in the damnation of the wicked. Now, He is the one who judges them and sends them there. He is the one who cuts the tree down, as it were. He's the one who orders them being cast into the fire. But we do need to understand that He doesn't delight in doing that. That is justice, and justice must be served. Now, again, the patience of the Lord is meant to lead people to repentance, and the Lord was being gracious and merciful to Israel and being patient with them that they might repent and turn to him. But the next point is that patience is going to run out. It eventually does. Remember how in the days of Noah, when the Lord says that their days will yet be a hundred years? I mean, what did he mean by that except that he was going to give them another hundred years under the preaching of Noah to turn from their sins and he gave them a hundred years. People lived a lot longer back then. And during that course of 100 years, not one person repented. And the flood finally came and destroyed them all. The Lord was being patient with Israel. But he eventually, after 40 years, people didn't live as long in those days, he eventually brought judgment in 70 A.D. We know that God is patient with mankind. But we also know that there is an end to his patience because the Lord calls souls to account to him every single day. And eventually we know the Lord is going to return to judge all mankind. There is going to be an end to all these things. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's true of everyone. None of us is better than the Galileans that Pilate killed. None of us is better than the 18 that were killed by the Tower of Siloam. We all deserve to perish 
Jesus says, likewise, in the same way. But the Lord offers mercy. Now, again, if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we've already received that mercy in His grace. We won't perish like them. We have eternal life. But that's purely because of God's grace and love and because of His patience. It's not because of us, not because of what we did. We need to thank the Lord for His mercy and His grace. But we also need to understand that there are many out there who haven't received that mercy and that grace, who aren't ready, and who are going to perish. So while the Lord is holding back the day of His judgment, while it is still the day of His mercy, we need to, to bear the fruit that the Lord wants us to bear. We need to be like a fruitful fig tree that bears figs. We need to continue to pray. We need to continue to live openly as Christians and not hide our light as it were under a bushel. We need to share the gospel with others so that they might find their way to him. The reason why Jesus said what he said was not to, to, to frighten them for no reason, but to frighten them so they would think about their well-being and that they might run to him. Remember what, the, what um, Jesus said about the ministry of John the Baptist? From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven uh, suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. What he meant was that John's preaching of judgment to come was getting people to rush toward the kingdom and to seek to get in it. That's what we need to do, tell other people the danger they're in and show them where the door is, the Lord Jesus, and get them to run in that direction. Well, may the Lord help us uh, to do that as we have opportunity with people that we know. Let, let's take just a moment and bow in silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard. Um, yeah, let's pray.